Well, anybody got any questions or anything that they wanted to bring up this morning? Any, any topic? Topic free? Question free? All right. Well, let's turn to Exodus chapter 4. And what I'm working on here, from God's perspective, is an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. All right? And, uh, you know, when I get to a certain point, you'll figure out what that means. But, you know, in the meantime, my job is to keep you hanging so you keep going to the next chapter. See, that's, that's the way it works. Tail end of uh, chapter 3, you know, God told Moses there in verse 22, he said, Every woman shall ask of her neighbor and the woman who lives in her house articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing, and uh, you'll put them on your sons and daughters, thus you'll plunder the Egyptians. Now, Moses, it's going to be a while before Moses tells the people of Israel that. But see, God's putting this in motion here <clears throat> right up front. So in chapter 4 then, Moses basically is asking the question, what, what if they don't believe me? Okay, and, and that's a good question because <clears throat> Moses has been gone 40 years, right? So who cares what he was 40 years ago? Who, who, who can even remember that? <clears throat> you know, he was at the age of 40 that he went down and, and uh, visited his brethren, the Hebrews, and saw the Egyptian slave driver beating a fellow Hebrew, and, and Moses killed him, which tells you a little something about Moses' physique. Um, <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> so he had to flee. He was, and it was 40 years later that the Lord appeared to him in the burning bush. And so this is, this is where God and Moses are still having this conversation. And see, it's a good question. What happens when I come back? I've been gone 40 years. Um, <clears throat> everybody's forgot. <clears throat> you know, nobody. They did, <clears throat> you know, I mean, the last question I had from, from the people of Israel was, <clears throat> who made you a judge and a rule over us? Do you want to kill us, kill me like you killed the Egyptian yesterday? That was the parting words for Moses from the Hebrews. So, good question. You know, what, uh, what do I got to do to gain a little credibility here? You know, you know I mean, Moses, like everybody else, he's got to have street cred, right? And uh, so what am I going to do to get my street cred? See, And so, you know, he had Moses throw the serpent, or his staff on the ground became a, a serpent, and Moses fled from it, and then God told him, grab that thing by the tail. So he grabbed it, turned back in staff. The same way he had him stick his hand inside his tunic, pull it out, leprous, stick it back in. It's, he says, okay, you got a couple of signs now, and uh, <clears throat> you'll be able to do those, and that'll start giving you a little credibility with, with Israel. And then, of course, Moses, like we talked about, tried to get out of it. He says, I don't, I'm not a particularly good speaker. And uh, finally, Moses, God tells Moses in verse 16, uh, Exodus 4, 16, he said, <clears throat> Moreover, he shall speak for you to the people, and he will be um, as a mouth for you, and you will be as God to him. You can see the relationship that's being set up there between Moses and, and Aaron. He says, You shall take in your hand this staff with which you shall perform the signs. So <clears throat> Moses then goes to, comes down off of Sinai, comes back down there in Midian where his father-in-law Jethro is, and uh, Moses gets permission from him to leave. Moses is 80 years old, but he gets permission from his father-in-law uh, to leave town. It was just called polite, okay? You know, if, if, you're, you know, if you're 24 years old and you're staying in your parents' house, <clears throat> it's just polite to say, hey, you know, hey, I'm going here, going there, just letting you know what I'm doing so that you have an idea because, you know, <clears throat> otherwise you don't know what's going on, all right? So Moses is doing that, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> so Moses then, in verse uh, 20, Moses took his wife and his sons and mounted them on a donkey and returned to the land of Egypt. So here's Moses, you know, servant of God, <clears throat> you know, the future great leader of Israel, lawgiver and judge, <clears throat> riding with wife and kids on a donkey. Okay. <laughs> Pretty interesting, right? Okay, Judy, I need you. The magic wand here. I just had a question in Acts 7. Moses is described as a man of power in words and deeds. Does that 
Do you think he really wasn't eloquent? And it just means basically he had the power when he said something, it was going to be executed? Or what, what's your take on that? Yeah. Well, you know, God didn't argue with him when he said, you know, who made man's tongue? So it's more like you were saying, it's okay, eventually when he says something, it's going to come true. Yeah. And again, God, God set him up and God backed him, but Moses had force of character too. You can see that. Uh, I mean, Aaron didn't have force of character, right? When pressure came on Aaron, he caved, right? See, and Moses, he didn't cave. Even Moses had to stand alone, you know, so force of character there too. I mean, Moses, God's man, okay? So in uh, verse 21, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Now when you go back to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders which I put in your power, but I will harden his heart so he'll not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I said to you, Let my son go, that he may serve you, but you refuse to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. Okay, so God is prepping Moses for what's coming. Okay. Again, that's, that's always important. If you can kind of go in forewarned and forearmed, it helps you get the, the proper mindset as to how you're going to handle things. I know my, myself, before I go in, uh, you know, to a meeting or something where I know that there's going to be an issue that has to be discussed or, um, you know, I always, uh, you know, go through the mental conversations in my head as to how they're going to turn out. Um, if I go into a Bible study where, you know, the person's not a Christian and I'm trying to work things along, I actually go over that in my head and anticipate, you know, how the conversation might go. What happens if the conversation goes this way? What if it goes this way? What if it goes this way? So I can be prepared, um, you know, mentally. It's, it's kind of like practicing before the game. And so God is letting Moses know. He said, here's, here's what's going to happen so you can get prepared for it. See, a little ounce of prevention here is going to be worth a, a pound of cure. Um, any, any comments here so far? Now, once again, see, now he's really laying the groundwork for the significance and the importance of the firstborn. And, of course, that ultimately is setting the stage. You know, if you bounce to Hebrews chapter 12 for just a second. See, Hebrews 12, 22. Contrast that with Mount Sinai, which, of course, Moses hasn't got to yet in Exodus. But uh, as contrasted to Mount Sinai, the physical mountain, he said in verse 22, you've come to Mount Zion, that's obviously the spiritual one, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, myriads of angels, see, and to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus the mediator in the new covenant, to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. You know, I was converted with the old Jewel Miller film strips they were, patriarchal age. If you haven't seen those, you know, you need to get a digital copy from me, not a vinyl platter. And uh, the original Jewel Millers were vinyl platters. And uh, then, they, then they finally came out with the mini cassettes. So by the time I started using them quite a bit, we had cassettes. So I come in, you know, Bible study. I had a screen. I'm carrying with me one of those that you prop up. I got a projector. <coughs> I, I've got the, the, the film strip, uh, I got a cassette tape recorder, and I got my Bible. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to figure out how to lock on the door. You know? <laughs> I remember one of them, it was, a, <clears throat> it was here in Bozeman, it was a, a Baptist couple that uh, Harold Hammond, Harold Hammond in Great Falls was the guy that immersed me. He just uh, passed away, by the way, just a couple weeks ago. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> Harold had immersed him and <clears throat> kind of soft sell, sold them. He accepted her immersion. Well, he accepted his because he was Baptist, and he wanted her immersed before they got married, so she got immersed because it was so they could get married. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, when they figured out that I was preaching differently, you know, they, things started changing. And uh, so I was ready to show the fourth Jewel Miller, which was um, um, 
number four, God's plan for redeeming man. And so I'm here. I got all the stuff at the door. <clears throat> you know, knock on the door. Door opens. He says, set that stuff down. We're just watching the, talking the Bible tonight. Okay, good. I like that because that means we're going to get directly into Acts 2.38, Acts 22.16. That was the last Bible study, by the way. Um, you have a lot of those. You just have to get used to the fact you have a lot. You have to go through a lot of people, people to get the few that are interested in. So they're, you know, the, the, like precious faith, the way the King James Version uh, described it there in Second Peter. So, But in, on the third one where it's talking about the church, it's giving you the different names for the church. You know, Church of God, Church of Christ, you know, Church of God in Christ Jesus. They enlist the Church of the Firstborn. And the, the, the film strip, the, the track, which is still the same track for the video stuff, uh, the, 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 the uh, voiceover guy said, see, all of these names give glory to Christ and not the people of the church. Missed it, see? Church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. See, the, the, the Christians are the firstborn <clears throat> that it refers to in Hebrews chapter 12. And, and God was laying the groundwork for that back there very strongly. He'd done it earlier, but he really laid it down strongly there in Exodus about the firstborn. He said, Israel is my firstborn son. And uh, laying the groundwork for the spiritual Israel being the true firstborn. And that's, that's pretty exciting. Now, the firstborn gets everything, just, just in case you wondered. And uh, so pass that on. Any comments on any of this? Yeah, Nick. Back to Exodus 4, by the way. So this is one thing that's always kind <clears> of <throat> stuck with me is how much free will did Pharaoh re really even have? Like, obviously we see multiple times where he's, mm -hmm. he caves in, and then but here it is, God saying, I will harden his heart. So how much free will did Pharaoh have, and how do we know that doesn't pertain to anybody else? Well, it's a great question, and, you know, God holds Pharaoh accountable, see, which lets you know he has the free will. See, God's using Pharaoh because he's got his man. man. He's going to make sure that, that it's hardened enough. But do you think Pharaoh was really planning on letting the people go anyway? No. No. See, so God's just going to make sure that he's, he's hardened enough so that God could execute his total plan that he's got to rather than, a, than an easy give. So Pharaoh has his own free will. Uh, God's using that, just like Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate had free will, but guess what? If Pilate you know, releases Jesus instead of having crucified, what happens to the plan of God? goes in the tank. See, same, almost exactly same parallel, different circumstance. Each of them's got free will, but God is making sure it gets orchestrated so that his overall plan. Is. And that's, actually, that's out of our league. You know, it really is. You know, we commented earlier, it ended, mo entered, you know, uh, Moses' uh, mind to visit the sons of Israel, right? I mean, where did that come from? You know, he's age of four. Oh, it entered his mind to go down. <laughs> okay, that's, where did that come from? Well, see, this is, you know, this is stuff, you know, too, too wonderful for us, really. You know. And I just, <clears throat> you know, I was just noticed some, some crows uh, working on a dead deer, <clears throat> you know, out in one of the fields. You know, it wasn't just one crow. It was a bunch of them. And how do the crows know that there's a dead deer in that field? I mean, okay, we don't know that stuff. You know, how do the bees know where the honey is? They're just, I mean, there's just so many things. And it's the same type of thing, you know, a little more complicated, but it's the same type of thing that man has free will, and yet somehow everybody executes his plan. And, uh, and so... You know, it's what Scripture tells us to do is, okay, God's going to do his part, so guess whose job is to do your part? <coughs> see, that's the message for us. But see, it's a, it's a great question. And people use Pharaoh 
Uh, if you go to Romans 9, I told you Exodus 4, but <clears throat> Nick changed the course of direction here. R Romans chapter 9. <clears throat> so, uh, um, I'll start in, uh, I'll start in verse 8. <clears throat> it says, uh, <clears throat> that is, it's not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. Promise meaning the Holy Spirit there. Okay, so you're born, spiritually born, it's contrast to physical born. For this is the word of promise, and he's using a couple illustrations here. At this time I will come and Sarah will have a son. You know, Isaac should have never been born, but it was the action of the Holy Spirit. But not only this, but there, but there was Rebecca also, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. <clears throat> For though the twins were not yet born, had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose, according to his choice, would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger. And just as written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I hate it. Okay. Now, you know, one of those is a quotation from Genesis, is one of those is a quotation from Malachi. Um, see, if, so if you're looking at this, it says, well, it doesn't look like man has free will. It looks like, every, like everything is, is preordained. <clears throat> what shall we say then? There's no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. He says to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy. I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. See, now if you, if you have a, a view of that about this big, you're going to say, well, it doesn't look like man has choice. Okay? And part of that, see, as it goes on to say in verse 17, for Scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. Okay? So, like I say, a view about this big would say, okay, man doesn't have free will, and uh, God cherry picks. You know, he, he decides this person gets mercy, and this person doesn't. This person gets compassion, this person doesn't. That's, that's what it looks like at a surface reading. But if you back up, you know, and get a little bit bigger picture, what's going on in Romans, see, he's making it clear that this is the illustration of God's sovereignty. That, okay, when he says it doesn't depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, that means if God doesn't provide a way of salvation for us, there isn't going to be one. See, So when he says, I'm going to have mercy on whom I have mercy and compassion on whom I have compassion, what that means is he's setting the boundaries as to where his mercy is, and he's setting the boundaries to where his compassion is. And you still have the free will of stepping inside those boundaries or choosing not to. See, so it's not cherry picking, it's that there's a plan. See, and predestination always has to do with the plan. And uh, foreknowledge has to do with the man, okay? And uh, so this is part of predestination here is that God has a plan. So Pharaoh fits into that plan. You know, Pharaoh, uh, I mean, Pharaoh didn't have to be Pharaoh. See, one of the things that Nebuchadnezzar found out is God elevates who he will elevate, and he casts down whom he casts down, right? You know, I mean, it took him seven seasons of being nuts for, to figure that out, you know, but at least he figured it out. Most people spend most of their life nuts, and they never do figure it out, right? Uh, but uh, so in there, in the, in the overall plan, see, man still has free will. And Pharaoh is kind of an extreme example of that, but he still has free will. And that's why God's holding him accountable. So further comments there, Nick? Yeah. It takes the New Testament, actually, to kind of, you know, give you the, the little bit bigger picture there. See, and, but how, I mean, really, how did God, or how about Abraham? Did God need Abraham? Yeah. At least somebody like Abraham. Uh, looks like he's the only one, right? Abraham by free will? Yeah. 
uh, God, God had a plan bringing Abraham in. And again, it, it gives us, you know, we just have to, again, get that, you know, back up, take a look at it picture. Remember, God built it from the back end first. You know, he started, started at the back end and built it to Genesis. And then he turned the history flip, switch on and let it, let it go. See, we can't even process that. <clears throat> but I know that that's how, how we always work. Any of you guys that ever, you know, any of you ladies ever figured out what your kitchen, you really want your kitchen to look like, right? <clears throat> you know, you, you got an idea what your kitchen, you want it to look like, and then your job is to try to get everybody else on board, you know, namely husband and anybody else is going to be involved in doing this thing, right? Okay. Um, you know, any guy that's doing a restoration job on a vehicle, he has a really good idea what he wants this thing. I mean, he's got colors and, you know, the chrome and, you know, how elevated he wants it. He's got that all in his mind before he ever starts. We do that because we're in the image of God. You know, like I say, I'm, mentally I'm writing another book. You know, I'm going to have to live to at least 150 to get all these books written. Well, 100, 200 at the rate I'm going. But, uh, you know, old John, Jeremiah Weller's coming up out of Hangtown, California, better known to you as Placerville. All right? And he's coming up out of the California Valley. He's had a couple claims jumped, so he's going to try his hand in Oregon, right? And that's how it starts. Now, but I already know how it ends. Okay? See, because it got the end built before the beginning. See, we, we authors do that. You know, anybody that ever does a, you know, like a TV presentation, they have what they call a storyboard. See, and they actually have all the storyboard. And so when they film it, they don't film it in chronological order. See, they, they film it based on how it's going to fit economically, which storyboard to film. See, and then they put it together in the editing room afterwards. See, that's, that's what God does on a big scale because he's still using creatures of free will. My uh, <coughs> Jeremiah Weller, he doesn't have any free will. I mean, he's he going to do what I tell him to, and uh, I, I might even change my mind. I might wipe a whole section out and do another section for Jeremiah Weller. See, but who knows? Uh, but see, God, God's amazing. He's big enough to have us do our free will and still have the storyline carry out. Pharaoh, great example. Further comment there, Nick? That's why I said not at the time. Because <laughs> uh, then I got thinking of James 1, 3 there. Let no one say that he, uh, when he is tempted that he's tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. So what's really the difference between hardening and tempting? Yeah. The hardening happens after the tempting. Uh, Hebrews chapter 3, you know, again, looking at it from a little bit of a New Testament perspective, Hebrews 3, 12 and 13 it says, uh, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after today, day after day, as long as it's still called today, so that none of you will be hardened, see, by the deceitfulness of sin. Sin actually is, is a hardening process. And you see that kind of again in extremes in addictions. Let's say somebody's got an opioid addiction, you know. And they're going to try to break that. Okay, it, it's easier earlier. See, and that's any any habit, any any bad habit that a person's got. The e the quicker you get on that thing, the easier it's going to be to solve it. Because uh, the more entrenched that habit becomes, the more hardened the individuals. You know, and uh, that's why we call them hardened criminals. See, they're pretty. So once in a while, somebody you know, breaks the mold and gets out of it. But for the most part, see, there, there's a hardening process that goes on. And you can see that in Pharaoh real clearly. For the comment? I think, Mike, did you have? A couple, th <clears throat> excuse me, a couple things that I think about uh, when it's talking about uh, free will. I think of 
God's looking and he knows the character or the, the, uh, the habit of the man. Um, and so a lot of times with Pharaoh, he knew that he would have been an arrogant, uh, I'm in charge type of guy. And yet he knew that I can use this. You know, and of course, I think it's like a chessboard. God does get to put pieces in places in his, his realm. But and a good example of that is, Samuel, or is uh, Saul, King Saul. After Saul sinned, Samuel comes to him in, in 1 Samuel 13 and said, The Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. So if Samuel would have done what was right, he would have never used, or sorry, Saul, mm -hmm. he would have never used David. Mm -hmm. it, the lineage would have came through, through Saul. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, when, when you look at it, as God knows the character. I mean, even uh, with Judas, you know, when Jesus picked him, he knew who he was. He gave him the money purse. He gave him every opportunity to repent, but he knew that he wasn't going to. Right. Even right at the last, friend, what have you come for? You know, see, good, good points. Uh, you know, and yet it was prophesied in Genesis 49 that the, the Messiah would come through Judah. See, because God knows. See, again, that's the part that we have a really hard time processing, how God can know, yet, yet man's going to have free will. So that's why he says, okay, I'll do my job. Now you guys focus on yours. Okay, my job to run the world, uh, your job is to run your life. And, uh, and you're going to find out there's a whole lot of things in your life that are outside of your control, and the quicker you figure that out, the better you're going to be too. You'll sleep better at night. Okay. <laughs> Most things, you know, the big things are out of your control. You know, they just are. You know, when Katie and I tried to get to Great Falls last Lord's Day, of course, it was snowing hard. So I thought, well, you know, what I'll do is I'll go up to the 19th the Spring Hill exit because they do generally do a better job of plowing the interstate than trying to run the frontage road. And, um, of course, that was a mess. But, you know, all of a sudden we get to the, the Belgrade exit, you know, the, you know, past the airport, the next one, they got the road blocked. The whole interstate's blocked. You know, found out later that there was a, what had happened was an 18-wheeler stopped at the, on, on the on-ramp, or near the on-ramp, and an SUV from Whitefish has come along, didn't see it, you know, schmucked the 18-wheeler and uh, killed the lady on the passenger side and uh, injured the, the driver. And, of course, when something like that happens, they just block the interstate. And so you're, uh, okay, all I-90 traffic's being funneled down Jackrabbit <laughs> in Belgrade and running the frontage road from Belgrade to Manhattan. You know, it took us 45 minutes to get to the stoplight at, uh, at Jackrabbit and, and Belgrade Main Street, you know. And we say, you know what, we're not going to, we're not going to Great Falls today. <laughs> See, now, that wasn't our plan. I mean, we were planning on going to Great Okay, I mean, we could have taken the, you know, the left exit and tried to do Amsterdam Road, you know, to, to, and then come back to Manhattan that way, but every, that was blocked too, okay? So your next option, turn around, go through White Sulphur Springs. That's all you got, okay? And that, yeah, Lord's Day would not have been a good day to go through, you know, go, go over that 7,300-foot pass <laughs> you know, over the Little Belt Mountains. Yeah, but, uh, so, okay. See, there's just things in God's hands, a lot of stuff that's out of our control, and part of our job is being able to accept that, you know, without getting frustrated about it. And, uh, you know, say, okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, God all, I mean, God wants us pushing on the doors. You know, um, you know you, just because the door is closed doesn't mean it's locked. So God wants us pushing on the doors uh, to see if they open, but sometimes they just don't open, and uh, you know that's that's the way it is. So, okay. any further comments on that? So back to Exodus four then. So God just got through making the statement, you know, that Israel is my firstborn, right? So in verse twenty-four, it came about on the, at the lodging place on the way that the Lord met him, met Moses, and sought to put him to death. 
Then Zipporah, that's Moses' wife, the kid's mom, took a flint, cut off her son's foreskin and threw it at Moses' feet. And she said, you are indeed a bridegroom of blood to me. I think there have been any doors they'd have been slammed. You know, I think there have been a place for feet to stop. You're blaming. Okay. And so God, the Lord, let him alone. At that time, she said, you're a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Now, remember, way back in Abraham's day, God said, from now on, all your males are going to be circumcised. Eighth day, okay, after birth. And any slave that you have in your household, circumcised. Um, and uh, so Abraham was circumcised right away, and all Abraham's male servants were circumcised. And uh, that, was, that was part of the deal. And God said, if you're not circumcised, you're not part of my people. So here's Moses' own son, not circumcised. Now that's not going to, you know, that's not going to work for down the road, is it? Now, where's the resistance coming from? Well, it's coming from Mama Bear, isn't it? See, Mama Bear is not wanting her son circumcised. I don't know how old he is, and I don't know which one it is by this point, but... Um, She's, she's been the opposition. And so that's why she's mad about it. And, you know, question, would you rather have your wife mad at you or God mad at you? Well, it's not like your wife mad at you, but, uh, <laughs> you know, when you figure the long-term picture, but better have the wife mad at you than God at you. So, God mad at you. So, but Zipporah is the one that uh, did the circumcision. So there must have been some pressure there. And, uh, but see, that was very important, wasn't it? You know, because the physical circumcision was the sign, you know, the physical people belonged to God. Without that, the significance of the spiritual circumcision being the mark that, you know, establishes a person is uh, the, uh, the true Israel of God doesn't have any meaning. See, so the, it's necessary for the physical to be there, to be there solid, even to the extent of having this happen, so that we catch the importance of spiritual circumcision, which, of course, we know happens in immersion. So comments on that. Yeah. Pretty interesting. So in verse 27, the Lord said, see, again, this is all, this is all groundwork God's laying. God, these details got to be handled. <clears throat> see, if, if, if Moses' boys aren't circumcised, then... You can see big problems down the road. So God handles it, see. So the Lord said to Aaron, go meet Moses in the wilderness. And Aaron has no idea that, that God and Moses had this conversation on Mount Sinai. And Aaron got no idea that God's already volunteered him to be Moses' spokesman, okay. He didn't know that. But the Lord says, go meet Moses in the wilderness. So he went. And met him at the mountain. See, they, they met Mount Sinai. Remember, Moses doesn't live on Mount Sinai. He lives probably somewhere around the base of Sinai in the, in the wilderness. But uh, he doesn't live on the mountain. And uh, so Moses told Aaron there in verse 28, uh, all the words of the Lord with which he had sent him and all the signs which he commanded him to do. Okay? So <clears throat> between verse 28 and 29, they pack up. Uh, Moses packs up his family. And, um, um, you know, they, uh, well, they're actually on the move here. Moses goes and meets his family wherever they were. But they're on, on Mount Sinai. See, so now they got to go clear to Egypt. they got to go across that Arabian desert. And so Moses and Aaron went and assembled all the elders of the sons of Israel. Okay. And, uh, and Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. And he then performed the signs in the sight of the people. So the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about the sons of Israel and they'd seen, he had seen their affliction, then they bowed low and they worshipped. See, they actually physically prostrated themselves. And they're pretty excited because deliverance from Egypt is just around the corner. Right? Yes. <laughs> okay. See, again... These things are written for our example, aren't they? See, because, boy, sometimes we have to wait a long time for the Lord to work. 
Lord's working. See, and they think, yeah, right away. You know, some people in the first century thought Jesus' coming was going to happen in their lifetime, too. Right? <clears throat> I think he's coming in 2022. Yeah, I sent out a text to that effect. A little bit snarky, but, <clears throat> you know, why, why couldn't he? It's best to live like he is. Okay? But he might not come until 2052. Imagine what the world will be like in 2052. Imagine what it's going to be like in 2025 when the average fleet sold in America has to have an average of 40 miles per gallon. Right? You know, the way they get around it right now is they, those same restrictions don't apply to Canada. So what the dealers do is they get stuff out of Canada, and that doesn't count. So they get their big pickups and the, and the ones that use more mileage, they get those out of Canada. And then their, their higher mileage, smaller vehicles is what they use to try to meet the EPA requirements. So you got a, a real <coughs> business going on here, you know, to, to try to get around the regulations. Because if, if you follow the regulations, you're gonna go out of business. Okay, so you're gonna pull Homestake Pass <coughs> and a two-cylinder engine that gets 50 miles an hour, right? You're going to plow through the snow, snow drifts, you know, that pile up behind the, uh, the uh, you know, guardrails. You're going to plow through those snow drifts in, in one of those, right? Electric vehicle. <clears throat> you know, I'm going to do the 450 miles chip that I make today with an electric vehicle. Oh, I'll have charging stations in Helena. Great. See, obviously there's something the public doesn't want it. You know, I tell Katie all the time, you know, you're sitting there, intersection, right? <coughs> Two guys in pickups, right? Okay, what's going to happen? Light turns green, roar! <laughs> See, I tell Katie, that's why electric vehicles on their own would never sell. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's a diesel repair outfit here called Black Smoke Diesel. Okay, why would, <laughs> see, it's obviously something being imposed on us from top down. And, uh, you know, the goal eventually is to get you out of your vehicle. Uh, the goal is to get you on a co social credit system where you don't own anything. You know, and in England already, they're making noises that nobody's going to be allowed to own private vehicles. So... You know, that, that's, a, that's an imagined agenda. Um, <clears throat> Thomas Huxley, who was uh, Darwin's bulldog, had a son named Aldous Huxley. Aldous Huxley wrote a book called Brave New World, which I read when I was in college just for fun. And, uh, you know, and I'm thinking, man, who'd want to live in this place? Um, you know, but he was, he was talking about what it's going to be like if we imagine I mean, he was in favor. I mean, that's why he called it "Brave New World." See, this is this is this is the agenda we need to pursue and get there. You know, so I don't know. Twenty twenty five. What if they implement the uh, the twenty thirty agenda? You know, so, I mean, and they're you know, build back better means we're taking your property. <laughs> that's what it means. Okay. And we have to deal with it. See, so they thought, yeah, you know, <laughs> Moses, the hero, man of the hour, <laughs> you know, we're going to be out of here. Okay? So chapter 5, Moses and Aaron came and said to Pharaoh. Now, how did they get an audience with Pharaoh anyway? You know, all Pharaoh's got to do is say, I'm not seeing you. But, you know, God's plan Moses is going to get his audience with Pharaoh, right? And so the petition is, um, 
Let my people go. It says, thus says the Lord. Thus says Yahweh. Just talking to Pharaoh here through, through Aaron. Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, let my people go that they may celebrate a feast to me in the wilderness. Now, of course, that feast is Passover, right? Now, Moses doesn't know the detail of it, but the Lord does. And Pharaoh comes back with this awesome answer. Now, who is this Yahweh? That I should listen to his voice. Well, he's about to find out, isn't he? But see, he's not, he's not particularly open to the idea of letting the people go. See, when the iron claws of government get clamped on the people, it's really hard to get them pried loose. I was watching a, a little clip of a guy from Australia. I think I caught it on Fox News. Um, and... Uh, he was talking about the tremendous lockdowns and stuff and the, uh, the COVID quarantine. He was a guy that was in a COVID quarantine camp, although he didn't have COVID. And, uh, and he was talking about the fact, he says, look, I'm trying to tell you people in America, this is coming your way. You, you've got to stop it. He said, Australia is being turned into basically a total dictatorship. And he said... Uh, you know, and he made the same point. Government, when it gets power, never releases it. See? And so Pharaoh's not about to release the power he's got either. He's, he's got a lot of slaves working, a lot of slaves. And so he's not about to just easily give that up. It's the way it works. Right? So verse 3, he said, uh, I mean... Pharaoh says, I don't know Yahweh. Besides, I'm not going to let Israel go. Not let them. And they said, well, the God of Hebrews has met with us. He already talked to us. And so please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the law, Yahweh our God. Otherwise, he'll fall on us with pestilence with sword. So we got to do what God told us. He's got punishment for us. You know, I think Caden was making a great point. You know, if there wasn't any hell out there, you know, in front of people, just think how much wor worse the world would be. And that's why the, the left-wing forces are at work as, as rapidly as they possibly can, destroying the concept that there's a hell and there's a day of judgment. Again, I was reminded of a group called Creedence Clearwater Revival, you know, that I used to listen to in college. And I remember one of the songs, the guy said, I'm not sure that there's a heaven, but I pray there ain't no hell. So you got to figure it out. Hell is not a nice place. If there is one, you know, uh, it's not a nice place. Well, <clears throat> there is one. And unless you're redeemed by Jesus Christ, that's where you're going. And there's no amount of imagination going to keep you out of there. You know, you don't get, what was it, Haley... Hunsicker there in, in Boulder, she said, the, I think it was last Monday night, she said, yeah, she saw a post where a woman said, I am not giving God permission to judge me. Those words could come back to bite her. <laughs> yeah. It's like the arrogance, absolute arrogance. And people think and they can tell God what to do. And you can see there's no gratitude, you know. Like it says in Romans, they didn't honor God or give thanks. So you didn't. <laughs> okay, why is the atmosphere, you know, got 21 or, you know, 20 some percent oxygen, 20.2 or whatever it is? Why is that? Why is the bulk of it nitrogen? Well, nitrogen's a nice buffer. Because if you didn't have the nitrogen, everything around you would be burning with the oxygen. Okay? So who set that up, right? Anybody have any liquid for, for breakfast of any kind? Orange juice? You know? Any anybody have to use anything that had water in it? Anybody that didn't use something? Okay, some of you didn't need to eat breakfast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, the water. It's water. you got to have... Carbon-based life has got to have water as a transmission agent. Okay? 
And uh, the only other possibility of having life with long chain atoms is silicon. And when you have long chain atoms of silicon, you know what you got? Rock. So the only option, it doesn't matter where you're at in the universe, the only option is carbon. And uh, yeah, you can imagine anything you want, but the fact is, it's going to be carbon. It's going to be carbon based, and you're going to have to live someplace where water is liquid sometimes, it's, it's uh, you know, vapor sometimes, and it's uh, solid sometimes, but not too much and not too little, and just right, you know. Okay, who did that? You know, who makes sure that the chlorophyll works in the plants to give us, you know, pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and water out of the, out of the ground and form sugar as the glucose as the basis for all life? Who does that? See, I mean, and you just going to thumb your nose. See, you're not honoring God and giving him thanks. See, Pharaoh says, who's the Lord? That's what these guys are saying. Who's Yahweh? Who is he? I believe, I believe it's evolution. Oh, well, yeah, that's okay. You believe anything you want. The fact is, evolution... They have to, you know, natural selection. The very word selection implies intelligence. See, it's just a, it's just a designer substitute. <laughs> they sell it. See, because people don't think that next step. Selection. To select, random does not select anything. See, selection implies intelligence. And you read any Charles Darwin stuff, he gives natural selection the ability, slow but sure, selecting which ones are positive and which ones are negative. <coughs> Random doesn't know what's positive and what's negative. Don't know the Lord. Who is the Lord? Who's Yahweh? I should obey his voice. Well, they're going to find out. See, isn't it amazing that the world can be sold such big lies? Big lies. I mean, I see people in their car still with masks on, trying to protect them from the contagions blowing out their hot air defrost, you know? And the truth is, everybody's known for a long time that cloth masks do not stop influenza. You know, it takes maybe an N95, and that might, that doesn't even do it. See, and the, the medical profession has long known that, see, but they, they, you know, they say we're going to have everybody masked in six feet distance, right? Now, if you're five feet ten, you know, you're going to catch COVID, but if you're six feet, you know, you're out of range, right? <laughs> How does this stuff get sold? See that? And so Pharaoh, he's been sold, hasn't he? He's been sold. Who's Yahweh? Well, God, who's Pharaoh? Well, he's God. He's God. He said so. Works every time. Works every time. So God's laying the groundwork here for us in Israel. You know, he's, he's teaching us lessons here if we're paying attention to what, that he's got a plan and, uh, and it gets executed on time. And on time means God's time. See, close with 1 Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5 and verses 6 and 7. If a person's looking for comfort sometime, I can tell them, hey, it's 1 Peter chapter 5, 6, and 7. Remember 1 Peter? And it's 5, 6, 7. 5, 6, 7. Okay, 5, 6, 7. Okay, that's like repeating the phone number, right? 5, 6, 7. <clears throat> See, that way you can remember it. See, 1 Peter 5, 6, 7, right? Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Oh, the powerful, powerful verses. What kind of hands God got? Mighty. 
Did he get Israel out of Egypt? We know how the story ends, don't we? Yeah. What kind of a hand did it take? Mighty. <clears throat> well, if we humble ourselves, see, our job, humble ourselves, right? Humble ourselves just means doing what you're supposed to be doing, where you're supposed to be doing it, with the attitude you're supposed to be doing it with. That's all. Okay. I have to admit, you know, yesterday I had to deal with my attitude. <laughs> you know, yeah. It just happened to me a couple times last week. Uh, early in the week, I sent out a text. I think Davis and some of the rest of you get those texts. You know, so I was talking about do your work heartily. As for the Lord, you know, it's great. Uh, <laughs> everything came apart, you know. So I was, I was having one of those days. Nothing worked right. Nothing went right, you know. And, uh, okay, so, you know, Wilson. That's how I talk to myself, Wilson. <coughs> You know, Wilson has to have a, an attitude adjustment here because he just he's the guy that sent out that text, you know, to great advice to everybody else, right? So, so, so sometimes, you know, the Wilson, you got to have a talk with yourself. Same way yesterday. I mean, just things, you know. Uh, but our humility, see, is, is okay. To be able to put it in God's hands. To be able to put it in God's hands. And... Uh, and he's going to exalt us at the proper time. When's that? When he's good and ready. Yeah, might be, you know, the day of judgment where he brings you up in front of the entire spiritual universe and says, well done, good and faithful slave. That might be your reward. Would it be worth it? Yeah, it would. That could be the proper time. See, But Israel should have cast all their anxiety on him, right? Because... The deliverer is coming. The deliverance is coming. He cares for you. See, they said, well, we didn't know God really cared. Didn't know God really cared. Glad to know God cares. Well, he cares. See, we really should know that because uh, we got the whole book. <laughs> 